Good morning, good day, good evening to you from wherever you may be joining. It's my pleasure to moderate this industry panel uh, here in the bio, IEA Bioenergy Conference today. I am Dina Wachowski. I'm vice chair of the IEA Bioenergy Executive Committee. I'm based in Austria and I focus my work on both the production and the application of biofuels. And uh, I will guide you through this session. Uh, actually, together with the co-moderator, um, Shara Ostheimer, who will be online shortly. And uh, so this session, it will be about uh, long-term markets for biomass and biofuels. Not saying that bioenergy is not important already today, because of course it is important already today. But also just taking note of the fact that in some sectors, other energy carriers are expected to become dominant in the future, so that the focus of application areas for bioenergy and biofuels are likely to shift. So in the transport sector, this means that we will see increasing attention to the use of biofuels in aviation and shipping and the heavy duty road applications. And in electricity production, recognizing that many fossil fired installations, particularly in Asia, are too young to be closed already. Co-firing of biomass will have to become important. So in this session, we will consider the market point of view and we will learn from operators what they expect from biomass and biofuels in decarbonizing their operations. But before we start the session, I would like to point out to you how you can interact. So first, of course, you can use the chat, but that's merely for saying hello and um, not for posing the questions. For posing the questions, we have a Q&A function in Zoom, so please pose your questions there. And then we hope that we will be able to um, address your questions during the session. And also we will take two polls. And um, my, I would say um, uh, we will just wait for another minute before we take the poll. Uh, I just see that Gerard Ostheimer has uh, joined the session. That was perfect timing, Gerard because I was just about to uh, introduce uh, you as um, you are the second moderator of this panel. And um, I also did already a bit of a brief introduction into the session, but just for everyone to get you know who is uh, the second moderator here, could you just say a few words about yourself? Thank you. Hi, yes, my name is Gerard Ostheimer. I'm actually giving a um, short, presentation as a panelist later, but I am serving with Paulo Frankel as the co-manager of the um, Clean Energy Ministerial Biofuture Campaign, which I'll be telling you about, and it's in that capacity that I'm participating in, that, in this event, so thank you very much. Thank you, Tara. So uh, then let's kick off this session uh, with the first poll, and I want to invite all of the uh, attendees to complete this poll. So question is, would you be willing to voluntarily pay a premium for products or services with a low carbon footprint as compared to standard products and services? And you have two options here. So you could say yes, sure. If there are clear credentials, like a credible proof, then I'm willing to pay a premium. Or you could say, no, it is up to regulators to impose that suppliers decarbonize their products and services, and everyone should really pay the same price. So this poll will remain op open just for a while. Um, please make your choice. Uh, we will have a look at the result uh, after the uh, introductory presentations from all our panelists. Uh, so with this, I would like to turn to the presentations. Uh, we have six panelists here uh, on the day, and um, I will introduce them one by one as they come up for speaking. Uh, so I start uh, with uh, Gerard Ostheimer uh, for his uh, first introduction. 
of the Biofuture Workshop and the Biofuture Campaign, uh, where he is the founder and CEO of the Biofuture Workshop and uh, a co-manager of the Biofuture Campaign. Um, Jared, I believe uh, you have slides um, which either you share or Ernesto will be sharing for you. Just let us know. And uh, please. Uh, in that ahead. case, let's have Ernesto start the slides. I'm I'm happy to go right into it. Perfect. So then, the floor is yours. Marco. Wonderful. Um, sure. Thank you, everybody. Sorry, it's. Uh, I apologize. It's three oh six my time and. I couldn't find the panelist link, so I'm a little uh, disconcerted. But if we could have the slides, then I am more than happy to. Just a second, please. In two seconds. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll wait for the slides. Great. Next slide. Great. So many of you have probably actually already heard about the Biofuture platform, but uh, the current Biofuture platform might be a little bit different than the one that you're familiar with. So as you probably know, the Biofuture platform is a government-led multi-stakeholder initiative that is trying to promote the global bioeconomy. And as many of you know, it was established at COP22 in Marrakesh back in 2016. And it was really motivated in large part by Brazil and in particular by our all, all of our good friend, Renato Godinho. After um, three, three years, um, a number of events, a number of reports, uh, the building of a uh, quite vibrant community Brazil transitioned the role of facilitator and secretariat to Paulo Franco at the International Energy Agency. And shortly thereafter, the Biofuture platform went from being a standalone multilateral effort to a initiative within the clean energy ministerial. And this was, uh, this happened in uh, September of um, 2020 actually. Now, the SEM is a very interesting platform. And so many in the bioeconomy space is, are not so, not so aware of what the Clean Energy Ministerial is, what the Clean Energy Ministerial does. But the Clean Energy Ministerial is a collection of um, nearly 30 countries that uh, account for about 90% of global emissions. And it works together in um, on a project basis to drive um, the uptake of clean energy. And this has largely been in the electrification space, but now it has been joined by in other initiatives like the hydrogen initiative, the carbon capture use and storage initiative, and now a, a bioeconomy initiative. The Biofuture platform is now the Biofuture initiative within the clean energy ministerial. And then what we did after that is that uh, very important to the Clean Energy Ministerial is industry engagement. And so this year we launched what is called the Biofuture Campaign, which I am happy to be the co-manager of with Paulo Frankel of the International Energy Agency. And the Biofuture Campaign serves as the vehicle for industry engagement. And that's what I'll be talking about for the next eight minutes. Um, something that I want to highlight from the beginning is that uh, we have launched, the Biofuture platform has launched its work stream on biomass quantification and sustainability governance. So basically, we, after a couple years of thought, have realized that the most impactful thing that we can do as a coalition of countries and industry is to build greater confidence in the sustainability of biomass, but also in the potential availability of biomass to serve as a feedstock for fuels, chemicals, 
and materials. And so even though it's the clean energy ministerial, we are working on the full range of bioeconomy products. And really what we want to do is we want to engage people who are not really aware of the potential of the bioeconomy, potential critics of the bioeconomy, and then to work with our allies to really make it clear the role that um, biomass and other carbon rich, rich streams, either from waste or direct air capture can play in um, the energy transition and the development of a circular economy. And next slide, please. I actually just talked about this. Next slide. Right, and so what has emerged lately is there's, there's kind of a new conventional wisdom out there. And I think this new conventional wisdom was very much on display during um, the recent COP in Glasgow. And why is that doing that? Sorry. Um, and that new conventional wisdom is that there's, there actually is such a thing as sustainable biomass. However, that biomass has incredibly limited supply. And so we as a society must think very hard about how we're going to use this limited resource and society should actually decide Next slide. Oh, is there a next slide? There it is. So as you know, there are wide estimates for the availability of biomass. And this was summarized very nicely at, in the uh, Energy Transition uh, Commission report on the availability of biomass uh, within and its role within a net zero emissions economy, where the ETC was making this argument that in fact, we need to be extremely careful about the applications that we put to the biomass. We need to think about the role of biomass today, the role of biomass in 10 years, the role of biomass in 20 years, the role of biomass in 50 years. And we need to account for the fact that this can evolve and that we can get much better at producing it and that um, there will be a, um, a transition moving forward. Next slide. And so we in the BioFuture platform, what we want to do is we want to understand this very thoroughly. And we are very much looking forward to working with different tasks from IEA Bioenergy TCP to generate that understanding for how biomass can transition over time. And our scope is that we, are, we don't plan on doing de novo research. What we want to do is we want to convene you to develop the best evidence-based understanding so for what's possible. We want to document the best possible way to produce and use biomass so that we can make these decisions and allow these decisions um, to mature. And we want to, of course, think deeply about the types of policies and regulations that will minimize waste and increase um, production. Uh, the whole purpose of which is to de-risk biomass for, um, in order to uh, upscale um, investment and upscale uh, production of sustainable products from sustainable biomass. Next slide. Uh, we have assembled a working group already that is consists, consists of the United States, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Hungary, India, Netherlands, and Uruguay. And we have a number of international agencies that are uh, deeply engaged in the um, organization of this and the driving of this, which is IEA, IRENA, IEA Bioenergy, and the Global Bioenergy Partnership. And our next phase, as we're reaching out to particular experts, we're reaching out to particular leaders in this space, we want to create an expert advisory group, but we also are going to have a further ring of input. And, and so we look forward to working with all of you moving forward. Next slide. Which brings us to the BioFuture campaign. As I said earlier, the BioFuture campaign is meant to be the industry engagement arm. And, uh, and, and the BioFuture campaign is actually going to be serving at, as sort of as a catchment basement basin to catch industry's input and to feed it into this sustainability and availability process. But then we will also be working on um, 
themes that are of interest to industry of itself and what has emerged. And at all stages, we want to be additional. We want to be valuable and we want to really work with industry to communicate to policymakers, to ministers, particularly at the next uh, ministerial meeting uh, in 2022, to make it very clear what bi the bioeconomy is capable of now and what the bioeconomy can be capable of. The, the founding countries there are uh, Brazil, Canada, Finland, India, Netherlands, Portugal, and the United States. And like I said, we're really focused on joint action between government and industry. Next slide. And we, we see that we create value in three ways. The first way is that we are raising the level of biofuture engagement in the international policy dialogue. I think a lot of people came away from COP feeling like the bioeconomy needs to be better represented. And so we look forward to driving um, for example, ministerial CEO engagement at the next meeting, which will actually be in the United States um, in September of 2022. We want to foster government industry work streams. The first work stream will be the work stream on sustainability and availability. And, and uh, I'm glad that we actually have um, my friend Rasmus Volanco here from We Mean Business. Something that we want to do is we really want to engage with net zero campaigns much of the leadership in the world on climate is coming from businesses. These business-led campaigns, whether it's the Mission Possible platform or We Mean Business or the Climate Pledge, they really are, they really should be the audience for um, bio and waste-based fuels, chemicals, and products so that we can work together to um, achieve a, a world with less than one and a half or less than two degrees warming. Next slide. And I'll finish by pointing out that um, the next meeting is the United States. And to highlight the fact that the United States is also the chair of the Biofuture platform. So we have a very powerful alignment where the US is hosting, the US administration will be very engaged. The US DOE is the chair of the Biofuture platform. And so it's an opportunity to make sure that the Biofuture, that the Biofuture is really represented in Pittsburgh. And US industry, um, actually just this week was um, very much made aware during a, a group biofuture campaign call, very much made aware of the um, potential for representing the industry um, to the world and to US stakeholders during the next meeting of the Clean Energy Ministerial right here in the United States next September. Thank you very much. Hopefully it was not too long. Thanks a lot, Tara. Very interesting. And I'm um, looking forward. That will be a great event next year, um, the Clean Energy Ministerial Meeting. Uh, just a quick question in the interest of time, because we don't have too much time. Um, you have uh, quite some countries already lined up for that campaign. Uh, anyone particularly which you would still like to get on board? Um, Sweden. Pardon? <laughs> Sweden. 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 Good to know. Sweden, so Sweden, uh, Sweden isn't answering our calls right now, but um, it, it, I, I didn't go into the details, but the Clean Energy Ministerial um, is basically uh, developed countries uh, from New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Korea, China, India, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Gulf states, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and then North America, Brazil, et cetera. Colombia, I think, is in there as well from South, from South America. And uh, in truth, uh, we sort of are, we're very strong right now in, in uh, Europe and the Americas. And we very much want to engage our friends, uh, New Zealand, Australia. I mean, really, it should be everybody. I will highlight that in 2014, the next SEM is going to be in India. And so I think there'll be a very strong opportunity to engage with Asian partners with, with, with that SEM. But um, in the near term, I, I would say that it would probably be Australia, Japan, Sweden, Italy are, are, are very much um, on our radar. Perfect. And you already have a message in the chat from Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> so with this, thank right, you. We're, we're, we're among friends. So this can, this can uh, yeah, anyway. So thank you very much, Dean. I appreciate it. And I look forward to, um, to moderating the discussion later with our panelists. Perfect. Thank you. 
So with this, I would like to turn to our next speaker. Um, let me introduce to you Robert Boyd, who is Assistant Director at the International Air Transport Association, IATA, where he leads the work on sustainable aviation fuels. And uh, Robert, please inform us about the prospects that you see for sustainable aviation fuels in the aviation sector, please. I think you're muted, but the presentation is can be seen well. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Okay, terrific. Sorry, I was doing a little uh, experiment on my IT, so uh, that's good. Great news. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I hope you're getting a little bit of overtime for presenting at 3 a.m. Uh, in the morning. Uh, I guess uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, engaging with uh, the sort of the coalitions focusing on, on net, net zero. And I think, um, well, I'd like to put forward uh, the aviation sector uh, as, as one of those as well. I know we do collaborate, of, of course, but there is perhaps a bit more of a message here I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll talk to very, very briefly. Some of you may well be aware of this, some may not, but about six weeks ago um, at the IATA, you know, IATA being the, the trade association that represents about 290 of the world's commercial airlines, um, at our annual general meeting, uh, where we do uh, make serious decisions in, in the form of declarations or commitments for, for industry on all sorts of topics. But this year uh, was particularly significant in that the entire industry uh, came together and committed to net zero uh, 2050. And that may not sound overly remarkable when, you know, there's certainly been a lot of momentum towards uh, net zero 2050 by countries and by other sectors um, but Jerry mentioned, I think, uh, a report, well, what was it, back in 2018 from the Energy Transitions Commission called Mission Possible. And, uh, you know, whilst the, the tagline was Mission Possible, it really identified sectors that are extremely difficult uh, to get to net zero. And aviation, um, yeah, aviation is one of those sectors. So uh, the fact that um, we were able to not just celebrate the handful of airlines that are, you know, you know making very positive proactive steps here, but actually bring the entire sector to be in alignment and actually aiming at the, the, the same target, I think was a, a really significant achievement. And it gives us something, a very, very clear, a very clear pathway uh, for decarbonisation uh, now to focus on. So I think that's uh, worth uh, putting out there. Hopefully that is news that you uh, are aware of. I thought it just would give you a very brief um, uh, conceptual uh, idea of how we, you know, think the, the progression towards net zero 2050 uh, will take place over the next 30 years. So this is a, this in a sense is a timeline here showing um, the abatement, potential abatement solution, I would call it. It won't be the same for every single airline, but it was used for our modelling purposes uh, to get cost estimates. And um, again, many of you would be aware we have an international scheme called Corsia, uh, which is a reduction, carbon offsetting and reduction scheme. So that's both sustainable fuels and also uh, verified offsets. That's going to play a role, but really what does the heavy lifting in terms of decarbonisation um, is sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, there's reasons why we uh, put, you know, the, the primary emphasis on that, on that solution. But just on this uh, particular wedge or this particular chart, you can see uh, SAF is going to be uh, doing, well, anywhere from sort of 50 to 80% of the decarbonisation, uh, you might say, as we move out towards 2050. Of course, there'll be other, um, other solutions there and also the business as usual improvements. So our total abatement uh, as a sector, we've sort of fairly accurately calculated that 21.2 gigatons, so 21.2 billion tonnes of CO2 to abate in a cumulative sense over the next 30 years. And from that, we can get price estimates. I mean, if it was $1 a tonne, you're talking a $21.2 billion um, abatement cost. Of course, it's not going to be $1 a tonne. We're talking in the trillions uh, of dollars for, for this energy transition. Saf, I mentioned it, it is uh, a sort of the cornerstone of our um, decarbonisation. The reason well, there's this maybe two messages to, to take on board from this particular um, uh, chart. One is, you know, the dotted red line there 
is the total amount of jet fuel that the aviation industry used in 2019. So you can see it's a very clear, um, a clear uh, target that we're heading towards and actually surpassing. So over the next 20 odd years, the ambition or the, the uh, imperative, I think is a better word, imperative is to stand up a brand new industry here to the, to the level, to the volume of what traditional jet fuel was two years ago. And I'd use 2019 because that was the last normal year, you know, ex COVID. So it really is uh, a, a huge uh, volume of SAP that we're going to be, uh, you know, looking to, to produce. Uh, starting relatively modestly, but probably from 2035 is when you see the, the really sharp um, increases there. Uh, we, we put the heavy reliance on SAF for the reason that some of the, the challenges of other ideas or other solutions, let's say hydrogen or electric, are less vague when it comes to SAF. We, we understand the technology. We have an approved, we have a number of approved uh, technological pathways, seven in fact at the moment, on ensuring we have a fit for purpose, uh, sustainable fuel to go straight into existing uh, infrastructure or, or aircraft. So that's good. Um, we've also, Jerry just mentioned sustainable uh, biomass to sustainable feedstock. That's really important uh, as well. So there's both biomass and then I would call it the broader feedstock pool, which can include things like, um, you know, waste gases or synthetic, synthetic fuels. So we do understand that relatively well, certainly acknowledge that Aviation is not the only sector that's interested in, in feedstock, but our modelling suggests that we do have enough feedstock on planet Earth to satisfy aviation's needs. Um, but I fully agree with the point that how that feedstock is deployed from a total economy perspective is going to be incredibly important. But that's the sort of the background there as to why we, we do that. And then a, a, the question of the volumes here on SAP, this is uh, drawing on some work we did uh, as the Air Transport Action Group. So, ATAG is the entire aviation sector. So not just the airlines, but the uh, airframers, the engine manufacturers, the real technical experts here got together about 80 to 100. And we looked at what contribution could come from different um, options, let's say, to achieve the net zero. Uh, that includes, you know, could we just put all the effort into radical technology or better operate, operations infrastructure? I mean, yeah, you can get improvements from those. But the, but the answer, again, supported what we've done in IATA is that we do need substantial amounts of SAP. So you can take a look at these numbers, whether it's the F3, F2 or F4 scenario, they're all getting up towards that two, three, four hundred million tonnes of SAF, which lines up with the other chart I just put in a different uh, scale, billions of litres, but they do match up. Um, feedstock is really important. We understand feedstock well, but we see an evolution on feedstock. So today it's predominantly 99.9% .9 of all sustainable aviation fuel is heifer, the hydrogenated esters and fatty acids. So that's the waste oils predominantly. So things like used cooking oil, tallow, perhaps some, um, uh, you know, ro rotation plants, biomass, like uh, oil seeds, but that is going to evolve. You know, we, we think that that could satisfy about 10% of aviation's needs, but it will hit a ceiling and we will need to move to these other feedstock options, whether it's municipal waste, whether it's uh, woody biomass, you know, waste, waste agricultural material. Um, morphing right across to the far right, where you start to see the, you know, the windmills, we all understand this, you know, producing, um, decarbonising the grids globally as a priority because we're going to need excess renewable um, electricity capacity for green hydrogen. Uh, that's going to be the, a key component of these synthetic fuels. Um, and, you know, it sort of links nicely into this um, schematic of, you know, our view for the, for the net zero um, roadmap, if we call it that, in, in the sense of feedstock is a three waved approach. So in this first sort of decade, we're going to see predominantly the, the heifer technology deployed. You know, it, it, will, it will significantly expand from where it is um, today. Probably some of the ground fuel um, infrastructure, so refining infrastructure for you know, renewable diesel will, will, will not just be exclusively producing fuel for that sector, but diverting some of that uh, production capacity towards um, aviation using some of those feedstocks, the same feedstocks. Uh, but then you'll see, you know, wave two, I would call it the advanced SAF, so big expansion at alcohol to jet, 
um, which is going to use some of that waste biomass, the fissure troughs, which is gasification, uh, could be municipal waste on, and other um, gasified uh, feedstock there. And then wave three being that 2040 to 2050 um, being synthetic fuel. So they're not going to be just sort of neat, they'll, they'll overlap, of course, uh, but that will be roughly speaking the, the scale up. And it is, a, I think, a good news story uh, here. I think probably links quite nicely in with IEA work on this topic as well. That we've we've had a well, we've we've had um, a century really where energy, liquid energy, has been dominated by a, a very select group of countries that have had the 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 hydrocarbon resource in the ground. Where this transition is an opportunity for many countries that have been uh, energy importers to turn that around and at least be satisfying their own energy need, needs, potentially um, develop opportunities to be exporters even uh, of energy. You can see here, this is the most recent modeling we've produced showing um, you know, production evolution of SAT will be uh, well, very relatively evenly spread right across the globe because of all the, you know, the feedstock geographic and technology combination options. Um, quickly on policy, uh, policy was mentioned. It is really important. It's extremely important for an international sector like, um, like aviation. The two uh, I just highlight here, the middle headline and then the, the, the bottom one. So next year, uh, the governments will assemble in Montreal to uh, discuss a long-term aspirational goal so not this, you know, what I just mentioned was the airline commitment. That's, you know, all private or some government owned companies, but, but all um, operators of aviation services. This is the government side getting together. And um, this is what will get enshrined in the national legislation if this is uh, agreed. Uh, it will be um, a, a very important, significant uh, meeting uh, at the assembly next year in Montreal. I think there is a strong probability we, we see a... Uh, an agreement on a long-term goal. I hope it's in line with what the industry has committed to. And that will set up um, a follow-on, which will be uh, this bottom one called the Conference on Aviation Alternative Fuel. That will be a meeting to attempt to agree on quantitative targets for sustainable aviation fuel going out to 2050, maybe even beyond. So the most important thing I think for aviation is to have a uh, aligned uh, trajectory of uh, you know, uh, um, achievement. So you don't really want a fragmented uh, sector. We want this nicely aligned. So this is where we're at in terms of... Can you come to a close? Yes, certainly. So this is where we're at in terms of um, the rough statistics. Um, the good news is there's a lot of economic benefit. You can see a lot of facilities, a lot of investment and um, a lot of jobs. That gets the attention of, of policymakers. So that's, uh, you can certainly read that at your leisure. So thanks very much. I'll leave it at that. Happy to take any questions during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Robert. Thanks. Um, so we just have one question here and maybe a very quick answer. And you could also provide a link in the chat, probably, uh, whether all the graphs that you were showing um, are available in a published IATA report. Yeah, yes, they are. I will dig up the link. Um, they're mostly on the IATA website, on the, net, the net, Fly Net Zero Fly Net Zero 2050. If you Google that, IATA should come up, but I'll find the link. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And uh, looking forward to hearing more from you uh, in the panel discussion. Um, so with this, we will turn to our next speaker. Um, so we have with us Jacob Soten. Well, I'm struggling with the pronunciation, Jacob. You might need to repeat it. <laughs> I and, think that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And you are a senior future fuels manager at Maersk in Denmark. And we know that Maersk is the world's largest integrated shipping company and very active in seeking alternative fuels for shipping. So I'm very uh, curious to hear about it. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Feiner. My name is Jakob Seiden, as mentioned. And uh, I, I'm in uh, the decarbonization unit of AP Müller Maersk. Uh, and, uh, I would like to present some of the thoughts we have on the biofuels. We've called the presentation uh, Decarbonizing Maersk, the role of biofuels uh, and fuels in general. But uh, looking at the, the targets we put up for Maersk in 2018, uh, we, we announced that we are, we are aiming at uh, getting to net zero by 2050. 
and that's a very ambitious target. We realize that, but we uh, we we believe that it's doable. We have already uh, worked on uh, energy efficiency and uh, and and decarbonizing in general for many years, and uh, until now, from 2008, we've uh, reduced the footprint of one container shipped by 46%, which is significant. And part of that is uh, energy efficiency, and part of that is also the ships becoming bigger. Uh, and we we understand that we cannot go that way all the way to zero. Uh, we need to, to stop using fossil fuels, um, and we need to decarbonize as soon as, uh, as, soon as possible. Um, a ship lives for more than uh, 20 years, and Oh, I'm not changing the slides. I don't know what happened. Okay, sorry. Um, a, a ship uh, has a lifetime of more than 20 years, and uh, it's very important for us to find the right solutions to, to start scaling those up well ahead uh, in time of uh, 2050. Uh, the shipping sector in total uh, uses uh, fuels in an amount of approximately 300 million tons of fuels per year. That's quite close to the figure we heard from uh, Robert Boyd in the last presentation, which was, uh, I think, 340 million cubic meters of, uh, of aviation fuels. So that's uh, the, almost the same amount that we uh, spend in shipping. This translates into almost 3% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know what happened uh, with these slides, sorry. Um, Maersk alone, uh, being a large shipping company, uh, consumes more than uh, 10 million tons of fuel per year. And that's equal to 0.1% uh, of global emissions. So we understand that we are part of the problem and we would like to be also part of the solution. Um, shipping is normally a low margin business. Uh, it's it's uh, not without uh, problems to, to add costs to the fuels, uh, but we, we do know that uh, <laughs> Right now, shipping uh, is, uh, is a good business, but on the long run, uh, it's a low margin business and it, it's important what the cost of the fuel is. We normally buy the fuels at the spot markets, uh, meaning that we, it's a commodity and we can buy it at the right price when, when the offer is there. Um, we know that going to, to green fuels will be different uh, they are not a commodity and we'll probably need to go into long-term uh, engagement and offtake agreements uh, to, to get these fuels. We are used to, uh, to use fuels of rather poor quality, and I'll come back to that, but that's an opportunity for us when we need to, to decarbonize. Here's an example of what happens if, uh, if we add 100% cost to the fuel. Uh, the shipping rate will increase by approximately 20% which is of course uh, very significant in a competitive market. But if you put it on, on, on the final cost for the consumer on products, it's, uh, it's quite a small increase. Uh, on most products, it would be well below 1% of the product cost, as you can see here. And for a very low cost product like a banana, uh, the addition is up to 5%. And we believe that consumers are willing to pay that uh, at, at some point. Um, in this slide, uh, I tried to show that uh, fuels is not the only thing we need to do to decarbonize. We know that fuels are very important, but changing the fuel will have a huge effect in our entire value chain and for our company. So we need to solve all the problems at the same time when, uh, when, when, change, uh, when finding uh, fuels for, for the future ships. Um, on this slide, I, um, I have shown some of the technologies that we are looking into uh, in our efforts to, to decarbonize the fleet. Um, some technologies like batteries and hydrogen, we don't believe will have enough energy density to, to our uh, ocean going uh, large container ships. But uh, the, the last one here mentioned fuel cells. We believe that in the long term, it will have a very important significance to, to shipping. On the second table here, I've shown some of the fuels that we can use in our existing fleet. Um, there's a number of different fuels, uh, and I've uh, shown to the left with green colors, those that depend on biomass. And one that I've highlighted is pyrolysis. Pyrolysis and HDL fuels, that's fuels that you can produce from solid biomass, and they will generally have a quite low quality 
but we believe that in shipping it, it will be possible to use them uh, to some extent. Um, the, the high quality uh, biofuels, as mentioned by Robert Boyd, like uh, HIFA and HVO and so on, uh, we believe that those uh, will be uh, used by other sectors, like for example, aviation. Uh, we use them today. We have a product called Eco Delivery, where we, uh, we, we offer uh, zero carbon shipping uh, for, for consumers that are willing to pay. Uh, and those are based on FAME and HVO and, and fuels like that. So we do use these fuels today, but we don't believe that we can scale up and, and, and use this for our main efforts in decarbonization. Uh, as mentioned before, we're used to, uh, to uh, handling low quality fuels, and we have uh, very large engines that can burn almost everything that comes into the engine. There will, of course, be problems handling the fuel uh, in the storage and so on if it's very low quality, but we, we, are, we are quite used to that. Uh, for HFO, as you can see on the picture to the, the right here, uh, we have a very high viscosity and we have uh, lots of impurities and, uh, and so on, and we, we know how to handle that. And that's a great advantage when we look into biofuels. We have only a few hard requirements for drop-in fuels uh, that, that can be used in our existing vessels. That the major one would be the flash point. It needs to be uh, above 60 degrees. Otherwise, our vessels are not uh, insured. Um, and that's very important, of course. Um, the stability also, we need uh, some stability. The fuel cannot uh, phase separate in the tank or something like that. So that's also important and miscibility. If we, if we blend fuels into existing uh, heavy fuel oils, it's very important that, that they mix uh, properly. But besides that, all the requirements we have from ISO standards and so on today, we, we try to challenge those to be as flexible as possible and be able to use fuels that are as cheap as possible, uh, but, but still okay <laughs> uh, for, for, for the ship. Oh, sorry. On uh, this next slide, I've shown some uh, more fuels, but these are not uh, drop-in fuels. These cannot be used in the existing uh, vessels we have. Uh, these are all uh, one molecule fuels. So it's a defined chemical. And uh, some are alcohols in the top and some are, are gases, uh, different gases in the bottom part of the table. And one that I've highlighted here is uh, methanol. That's a, a chemical and a fuel that we believe in very much in MERSC. Uh, and I've shown here that uh, it can be produced from either the green pathway being biofuels or the red pathway. Not that it's not green, but, but I've highlighted with red here. Uh, the red one, which is e-methanol produced from CO2 and hydrogen. And I'll come back to, to those two. Um, other interesting one molecule fuels would be DME and ammonia in the long term. But, uh, but methanol is something that we are already investing in and we know that works. And a very important differentiator is methanol being a liquid, which is a great advantage on the ship. In shipping, there's a chicken and egg dilemma. Uh, nobody wants to, to buy new ships that can, uh, that, that can run on green fuels uh, because there are no green fuels. And nobody wants to produce the fuels because there are no off-takers. And uh, we've tried to, uh, to, to go in and challenge both the chicken and the egg. On the chicken side, we, we've already invested in uh, eight large container vessels that we'll receive in uh, three to four years. Um, and they will need quite a lot of, uh, of uh, methanol uh, to be fueled. We've also purchased a small uh, feeder vessel and secured the green methanol for that one. And this methanol is based on e-methanol uh, from uh, biogas, CO2, and hydrogen from solar. So uh, that will be run, running in two years from now. Uh, and that's a good start, but it's not the, the final solution to, to, to our ambitions. On this slide, uh, I've uh, tried to, uh, to show the, the need for hydrogen to produce fuels. And in the table to the right here, you can see the amount of hydrogen you need to produce uh, methanol. Uh, and the, the green uh, columns here show the need when you use biomass as a starting point and the red column shows uh, the need for hydrogen when you use CO2 as a starting point. And uh, not to go into details with the numbers, but you need approximately four times more hydrogen to fully utilize the carbon that you have from your biomass feedstock uh, compared to the CO2 uh, carbon you have in CO2. And carbon uh, in CO2 can also be, be a limiting resource. So going into sourcing of carbon 
uh, for that is also going to be a great challenge for us in the future. Okay, uh, last slide. Uh, I know that I'm running late, but uh, who is going to need the, the limited biomass? That's of course the question for today, and we don't have the answer, but uh, but it's something that is really important for us to to try to understand. And we saw the the uh, the nice figure from uh, Gerard Ostheimer with a, a a large number of studies showing different uh, availabilities between I think it was 28 and 280 exajoules. And uh, in this study I've shown to the left here, uh, there's a number of 210 exajoules biomass, of which 81 uh, exajoules are energy crops related. And if we take that as a number, 81 exajoule available for, for energy purposes, we would see that uh, the shipping with the amount of the uh, fuel oil I've mentioned before will uh, consume approximately 15% if we assume that all the energy can be used as fuel. Uh, and for Maersk alone, that would be 0.5% of this uh, biomass. And uh, maybe it doesn't sound like much, but the 200 companies like Maersk would take all the biomass. And we think that's, uh, that's probably not uh, possible for us. And if we cannot use biomass for, for all our fuels, then we'd need to go to, to electrofuels, uh, as also mentioned by, by Robert Boyd in the aviation. And uh, to do that, we would need a lot more uh, renewable power. Uh, and uh, to fully uh, decarbonize using uh, electrofuels, we would need something like 25 gigawatt offshore wind from Maersk only. That uh, translates into approximately three times the energy consumption today of Denmark. So that's quite a lot. So with that, uh, I would like to say thank you for your attention and uh, we'd be happy to, to, I'm looking forward to the panelist debate and we'd also be happy to hear from you after this conference. My email is given here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. And um, I see some questions coming in, uh, but we um, we don't have a lot of time. So, no, no. Um, Jerry, I guess maybe we can take the ammonia question in the panel discussion because there is actually already two questions about ammonia. Perfect. Um, so right. then uh, there's just this one question here that shipping costs have gone up more than 20% this year, uh, whether you have modeled this or considered this in your models. Uh, this is not really a model, it's just a basic calculation, I think, but, uh, but shipping uh, rates this year are, I mean, it's due to a lot of uh, factors and uh, restrictions in, uh, in harbors and so on, and I'm not an expert in that, but, but I, I, don't, I think the, the long perspective is more important here, that we are into a competitive market where adding 20% on the shipping rate is, is difficult. Uh, but if it's something that is uh, imposed to all the shipping companies, it's doable. So I, yeah. I, I don't have the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you very much. So we're turning to our next presentation here and uh, we have with us uh, Rasmus Valanko, Managing Director uh, for Systems Transformation in Women Business uh, based in Finland. And he works to implement systemic change by working with companies and partner organizations on climate change. So I'm looking forward, uh, Rasmus, for you to share your experience on how business leaders can work towards net zero operations. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dina. So let's try and win back a little bit of time. We Mean Business is a coalition of seven organizations who work with companies on climate change. We have a number of initiatives, many of which you've heard of before, like SBTI, RE100, etc. But enough about We Mean Business. We're here to talk about company ambition. Um, and a good indication of company ambition on climate change is how the science-based targets initiative has been growing over the years. And essentially, we're at exponential growth at the moment. And this is recognized really by, first of all, companies understanding that, you know, setting their own targets uh, cannot be done in a vacuum, only looking at what is possible in terms of their own uh, assets and capabilities, but rather there is a need to backcast in some senses to fit the science. So what we've seen is a shift over the years, really, of an understanding of what is the carrying capacity, essentially, of the planet or the atmosphere. And therefore, how do companies need to adjust their strategies to 
fits into that business context. And a really good indication of the growth really here is that um, I did these slides yesterday and, and actually while you guys were speaking, I, I thought I'd just check the numbers uh, to see if they're still accurate. And since yesterday, 14 new companies have been added to the science-based targets initiative. So not, there's not only the science-based target initiative, there's other um, um, very credible uh, platforms for companies to showcase their ambition and take action, like the Climate Pledge, for example. And uh, the total number is a bit, a bit bigger there. But where are we seeing the action? Um, and if you look at the, the split between the sectors, uh, they're on the left-hand side, you'll see essentially, you know, the kind of business activities which are relatively simple to electrify. Um, and the solutions are relatively simple and well-known. So it's no surprise that those companies have moved faster in terms of declaring their ambition and moving down the uh, decarbonization pathway. When you move to the right of this slide, you start to see some of those, um, it was mentioned before, harder to bait sectors. For example, in transport like shipping or aviation or in industry, cement, steel, aluminium, et cetera. So it's not an even game for companies and, and companies have very different starting points as well in terms of this. But also from a bioenergy or biofuels perspective, you can start to understand that, you know, there is a big difference between, um, you know, how quickly companies can move depending on which sectors they are in, and therefore that's what their ambition is. So what's also flavoring, let's say, the way that companies are looking at the landscape of uh, possible solutions and, and how are they interpreting, you know, the bio energy space. So one of the things about the bioenergy space, which makes it a little bit difficult for uh, many companies who are, haven't been seeped in the technology as technology providers or, or you know, um, working on this topic for a very long time, is that it can seem quite confusing and it can also seem quite risky because um, there are plenty of considerations that need to be designed around for securing sustainable feedstocks. Um, and uh, food, feed, and fiber, of course, you know, are, are some of the competing land uses uh, for biomass. But then also, I'd say one thing which is particularly now in the last year grown in importance uh, in the public dialogue in particular is the need to um, safeguard biodiversity and also to ensure that we use land as a carbon sink as well. And so you can see here that, you know, there's some risks that are for many companies unknown. These are things which companies maybe aren't familiar with if they aren't you know, from the forestry industry or from the agricultural industry. And so uh, there's a certain uh, hesitance to jump into uh, looking at bioenergy type solutions for their businesses. ETC was mentioned previously as well, and, and they did a, a really good piece of work this year. Um, I really recommend looking at the Global Bioresources reports. Um, and, and I wanted to show this picture because there are, if you look, take a demand perspective, um, it is very clear that there will not be enough uh, sustainable biomass available to meet all demand. But then again, no sector or no company has really been saying that biomass should be um, used to um, fulfill all of the demand. So there's, there's much smaller um, availability of, of sustainable um, biomass. And, and so the question becomes, where do you use that biomass um, sensibly and sustainably? And there's, there's many ways that you can cut this. Um, the way the ETC looks at this, and, and actually Jerry mentioned this already, is that you can try to prioritize the uses of biomass for specific sectors. And here we have a bit of a, a, a difficulty because um, a lot of time in these kinds of conversations, we're taking a global view. And so if you take a global view, then you have to make choices. And uh, those choices, at the moment, there's a, a, a general consensus that um, looking at the petrochemical industry, particularly the plastics um, industry, um, the need for a new uh, feedstock to replace uh, gas and, and, and oil is certainly needed um, and one of the priorities, as well as we were speaking about sustainable aviation fuels as well. There's, of course, um, let's say a second tier um, of uses, which is that uh, small box on the right hand side there. Shipping is one of those uh, that's included as well. But what masks, let's say, uh, what's masked by this global picture and this kind of global conversation is the local variability. So in other words, um, when it comes to bioenergy, 
it's very much dictated not by the broad strokes um, that we tend to talk about here, but rather the local conditions. And so what we've found over the years, particularly from the biofuels um, experience, is that it's very difficult to paint with a very broad brush in terms of what is good feedstock or what is a good conversion technology or end use, but rather it's very project specific. And when it's project specific, it's also location dependent. And so what we do expect to see is that um, there will be a lot of variability depending on the natural resources and the existing industries um, that are in place in different countries as well. So this split um, is not going to be you know, replicated in, in each country, but rather this is just a global view of what could make sense. And so I just wanna end with uh, the fact that um, we now have a global consensus in terms of countries. We have a very good global consensus, at least in terms of the multinational enterprises, that we need to stay below 1.5 degrees of global warming. And what that means in practice is that, yes, there are some simple, uh, or should I say, relatively speaking, more simple solutions that are available on the shelf today. But we also need more solutions to be um, to actually be successful. And the key thing is we can't leave any of those solutions on the table unused. And what that means for bioenergy is that each individual company does need to take a serious look at the opportunities that bioenergy presents for their own business in the markets that they operate as well. I'll leave it with that, Dina. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Very, very interesting presentation. Uh, in particular, I did like your slide where you're putting up different demand sectors uh, against biomass potentials. And I know that um, others might have different projections on how much biomass would be available by 2050. I think IEA says there should be 100 exajoule um, by 2050 available on sustainable biomass. Um, but but it, it's a really useful slide to see, uh, yeah, we can't do all of it, but we can do a lot of it with biomass. Exactly. Uh, in, that, uh, in that slide, that was the prudent scenario. So they have also, let's say, a high scenario, which is about double that. So align okay. with the IEA. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, just, just one quick question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your number of companies was already outdated because 40 more have joined. Uh, how do you convince companies to join? Well, right now, it's you don't need to do much sales. I mean, a few years back, it was a hard sell because um, it, was, it felt risky. And it, and it felt risky because it was unknown. So in other words, uh, at the highest levels of companies, when you were into um, the senior management or even the board, relatively speaking, there was a low um, understanding of sustainability as a whole, but also climate change. And, and very few companies had maybe done the techno-economic assessments of what does this mean uh, for my bottom line in terms of taking a stance and, and, and having a very ambitious target. But now, as, as let's say the, the awareness has grown and the technical capabilities of companies, uh, especially in the leadership, has grown, um, the risk is no longer as much an unknown risk, but rather a known risk, which can be managed as well. And so that's the big difference now. And I'd say another thing which has helped incredibly is that we've seen uh, leaders in pretty much every sector who have gone above and beyond what you would expect, you know, the trade associations to say what's possible. Uh, Maersk is a great example of that in, in terms of, you know, uh, ordering the eight container ships. So really saying, this is the future, this is where we're going. Uh, we've seen the same thing, for example, even just, uh, I think it was today, United Airlines saying that they flew a 100% staff flight with passengers already. You know, it's these kinds of signals, um, or even, you know, the steel plant working on hydrogen in Sweden, that give other companies the belief that the technologies are there, they will be rolled out, and therefore they can also uh, join that movement because their suppliers, their customers, their value chain will support them in their journey as well, because we need to do this together rather than as individual companies. Thank you. So you hope to see exponential growth there uh, as things become rolling. Thanks a lot, Rasmus. <laughs> Thank you.
So um, we have another two presentations to go, very interesting presentations, another one on fuels uh, before we in the end will turn to um, bioenergy. Um, so with us is Alessandro Bartoloni, Director of Fuels Europe. Um, fuels Europe is a division of the European Petroleum Refiners Association. And um, yeah, I'm curious to learn about how European refiners see the future of low carbon fuels in the transport sector. Alessandro, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dina, and uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, very happy to be here. We are uh, a um, European association. In the meantime, I'll share my screen. And, um, but I think that we can, we can give a, a European perspective, but I believe it is, uh, interesting also in this uh, global context. So um, we represent uh, the European refining industry. Uh, you see there uh, the logos, 41 members, our members, and you recognize, I'm sure, many of them big multinational companies, but also national and regional companies operating refineries in Europe. Um, very mm, straight to the point, what's our strategy? The, we see the future of refineries as uh, um, a energy hub in an industrial cluster. This is a scheme of a refinery today, 100 per, not 100%, but the vast majority of the feedstock today is crude oil, is fossil feedstock. So all the products we make, the great majority is fossil products, fuels, first of all, but also lubricants, bitumen, solvents, and many others. Now, the strategy our members have agreed on back a few years ago is to progressively replace crude oil by biofeedstock, sustainable biofeedstock, recycled the CO2, and waste, an important resource. One of the benefits is that we will keep producing uh, liquid fuels, the advantages are out of question in many sectors, and we can reuse the existing infrastructures, pipeline, terminals, uh, down to petrol station. The petrochemical feast, of course, is an important product, and all of these can be derived from biofeedstock, recycled CO2, and waste. One year ago, we issued our Clean Fuels for All, you can find it on our website, and that's a link, where we went deeper into the strategy and we had a, a technical assessment of what is possible by when we can have uh, uh, low carbon fuels, renewable low carbon fuels, uh, replacing fossil fuels, and what's the cost for the industry. Uh, the last point is 650 billion euro over, over the next 30 years, so quite a significant investment. But what we aim at is to, and there I can show, to make use of the technologies, the most promising already existing in pilot or in demonstration scale, in some cases in, in industrial scale, and uh, multiply the investment, learn by doing, reduce the cost, and put on the market more and more uh, renewable low carbon fuels uh, to replace uh, fossil fuels. Uh, in this chart, you see on the left uh, what are the, uh, the feedstock, so all the, let's say, the, the, the sustainable fuels, uh, biofuel first generation. We don't think that we'll need the investments to expand the capacity in Europe. But we have enough, there is a ceiling, there is uh, no push actually to expand that. Hydrotreated vegetable oils, lignocellulosic cellulosic residue and waste, and defuels, that's where the investment will be really needed. And the chart on the left, on the right, you can see the, the development uh, of, uh, of investments in Europe going to the some 650 billion at the end of the period, uh, 2050. This is happening. This is not just uh, uh, empty declaration on our website we have a, a page we update constantly every dot uh, is uh, represents at least one one or more projects consistent with what we highlight in the in the clean fuels for all uh, where that it is that is being installed or it's already running refining uh, venezia first biorefinery in europe since uh, 
four years is producing 100% HVO, no more crude oil, no more fossil fuels, and many more are coming. Um, I will uh, just focus on this box here. This is uh, our policy recommendation to, to policymakers. And often there is a tendency, at least in Europe, to say um, renewable low carbon fuels, so yes, but for aviation, for uh, marine, and that's it. We say, well, actually, from the perspective of the investor, and please remember 650 billion Europe, it is important to think of a, of a global perspective, of a holistic approach. Fuels have a, a market, an important market in the road first. There is a lot of uh, internal combustion engine uh, vehicles on the road right now, and they need uh, to decarbonize, they need to be fed by low carbon fuels. Over time, of course, the demand in road will decrease, and more and more fuels will be dedicated to shipping and aviation. But the strategy of an investor needs to be holistic. So look at all the sectors of transport when investing in fuels. Um, there is, there's been uh, in the previous presentation uh, uh, quite a lot of discussion on what's available what is really there. And indeed we get uh, challenges when we talk about our strategy and say, well, it's nice what you say, but simply there is not enough uh, availability of sustainable biomass. Uh, soil needs, needs to be dedicated to food. And uh, there is also potential impact on biodiversity. So let's forget about biofuels. We believe this is wrong assumption. That's a lot of, um, ideology there. So we asked the, the Imperial London Consultants, Imperial College London Consultants to do a study on what is available in the EU, uh, potentially up from now up to 2050. And we asked them to be very conservative. Look at what uh, is today uh, qualified, what qualifies as sustainable. So for those of you familiar with the, the European legislation, the Renewable Energy Directive Annex 9, uh, part A and B the highlights what is not in competition with food, what is sustainable for advanced biofuels. And we told the uh, Imperial College, just look at them, just look at this list. The list is expanded, but look at what is there today. And the study, that's a lot in that, that we have the, the link. So you can see that what are the, uh, the sources of biomass, uh, agriculture, from forestry, from waste, uh, even a sensitivity on algae. And then all, all, uh, all the definition are there. And the, the study was pretty uh, specific because it looked at uh, all the sectors in all the countries in the EU. So the mapping is really, is really accurate. And uh, in terms of uh, prioritize the use between sectors, a very important point, uh, what the Imperial College did was uh, to take, consider all the biosectors, bioenergy and bio-based products, the bioplastic and so on. So the first uh, priority was take the uh, sustainable biomass and use them for uh, bio-based products. What is foreseeable will be needed in Europe. Then what is left, uh, allocate uh, the sustainable biomass uh, to energy. So power, uh, heating, industry, uh, service and agriculture, take them away. What is left? What is left is for, for fuels. Is this enough? And uh, we can see here this chart, uh, million tons equivalent of fuels, low carbon, renewable low carbon fuels. This is the red line. And according to the strategy we have uh, uh, designed, uh, we go from some 20 million tons equivalent today to some 160 in 2050 in Europe. Two big families, one is the sustainable biofuels, the green line, the other family is the e-fuels. And the, 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 the total of the two is the red line. We ask at the Imperial College, don't look at the fuels for the time being, look at the biofuels. Is there enough biomass available? And the answer is in 2030, much more than needed. In 2050, still a, a, a range, but still more than what is supposed to be needed to support the production of some 80 million tons equivalent of sustainable biofuels. 
What does it mean? Let's put it into perspective. This is the same red line, but uh, the, the scale here is uh, different because we wanted to show the blue line. What is the demand for total liquid fuel? So today, 350 million tons equivalent, and today only a small part is low carbon liquid fuels. The rest is fossil. The demand will decline the demand for fuels in Europe, of course, because of electrification in, in road, because of hydrogen, because of better energy efficiency. At the same time, if the strategy we design is successful, the red line will increase. So what does it mean? That we will go from 5% to 84% or potentially 100% of low carbon fuels, so no net impact on climate, uh, from, uh, from low carbon fuels. So all the demand for transport, aviation, maritime, and what is left of road can be fed by 100% renewable low carbon fuels. This is the contribution to decarbonization that our industry, but specifically in this case, uh, the low carbon fuels uh, can provide to, uh, to the EU to reach the climate neutrality in 2050, which is a a target we completely share, our members are on board with. So this was uh, just a, a quick overview of what we are doing, but I think the me basic message is, yes, there is a strategy. Yes, there is a commitment. We need a regulatory framework that does not exclude the fuels that consider uh, in an unbiased way the sustainability of biomass. Uh, and there is a lot of bias, I must say, in the policy, policy, policy debate today to um, unlock the potential of, the, of this very important part of the decarbonization. This is all I wanted to, to share. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandro. <clears throat> very interesting presentation. And um, good to see that um, your study provides that uh, there will be sufficient biomass in Europe to provide the fuels needed. Um, uh, even more good to see after so many years where it has been difficult to approach refineries that now the refinery industry is on the same page as the biofuels industry, aiming to decarbonize the fuels that are used in the transport sector because this is really an urgent need. Um, so that, that is really very nice. Um, I'm just looking because there was one question that just came in, but Jerry is, is taking care of that anyways. Um, so I just have a quick question on the relationship between the uh, refinery industry and the biofuel industry. Uh, so I see that you're taking a lot of activities uh, that in your own sector. Uh, how is your partnership uh, with biofuels industry? Is it a partnership? Are you buying from them, or is it um, are are you high competitors, or is is it a joint going forward? <laughs> Interesting question. No, I think the the competition or the alternative, let's say, is a thing of the past. There is a lot of overlap. Many of our members are uh, heavily into the production of biofuels. Uh, I mentioned the Venezia, but already today there are three uh, biorefineries in uh, in uh, Europe. So zero crude oil, all sustainable biomass, and these are our members: ENI, Total, uh, Repsol is doing the same, and uh, and other companies, other what is considered traditional oil companies are deeply engaged in, in this in this sector. You have seen probably ExxonMobil uh, uh, working at the uh, development of the algae the technology. So there is a lot of activities there. Simply, I think that the, the big change in, in uh, mentality with respect to years ago is that number one, our members uh, has agreed on the uh, target of net zero in 2050. And the second, that they have realized that as a consequence of that, uh, petroleum cannot be used anymore. It, certainly not in two days, not in two years. There needs to be a transition, otherwise you, you don't have, you kill the industry to, to, to no benefit to anybody. So there needs to be a transition, but the end game is no petroleum in refineries all biomass or recycled CO2 and all waste. This is the picture I would uh, outline today. Thank you very much and very good prospects. So 
with this, um, we will turn to a quite different uh, topic now, because uh, so far we've been mainly focusing on transport fuels, but uh, there is an urgent need to also address um, ele green electricity production, power production, phasing out coal, um, especially in, in Asian countries. And I'm very happy to introduce to you Andrew Michener, who is general manager at the International Center for Sustainable Carbon. I understand that this is a sister TCP to IEA Bioenergy. So it's uh, also a technology collaboration program working under IEA. Uh, it was formerly known as the Clean Coal Center, but now it's uh, the Center for Sustainable Carbon. And um, Andrew has a really um, extensive experience in fossil fuel and biomass utilization. And so I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, Andrew. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dina. Good day, everyone. Pleasure to be here to talk to you. I'm going to touch on the time available, uh, looking at the opportunities within or potential opportunities within Asia uh, for significant bioenergy use within the power sectors of that region. At which point my screen freezes up. Ah, come on. Right, great. Um, so a very brief word about our, our role as a TCP, then put the situation in Asia into context. Part of the presentation is the scope for bioenergy utilization in the power sector, a couple of key takeaways and I'll be done. Uh, we are, as Dina said, we are a, a sister or brother TCP, the IEA Bioenergy. We are dedicated to providing independent information and analysis on how biomass, coal, and other carbon sources can come, become cleaner sources of energy and be compatible with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So our remit that we align our work with is rather broader than just carbon emissions. We look at the fuller range of sustainable development goals from the UN. We are a cost-sharing TCP, and we are funded by a mixture of national governments and corporate industrial organizations. What the world is clearly not homogenous. Different regions have uh, achieved different economic capacity levels and then will address their climate concerns in different ways. It's not, I would su strongly suggest it's not up to OECD countries to tell the developing countries what to do, not least since the OECD countries produce most of the historical carbon emissions as develop their national economies. And, and Asia is very much a case in point here. This is a, as you see, a, a representation of the world, and Asia is seen under the spotlight to the right-hand side of the, the picture. The region contains well over 50% of the global population, and it only has access to some 38% of the world's energy resources. It does contain some advanced OECD nations, such as Japan and South Korea, but more particularly in the context of our discussions today, there are some massive developing countries such as China, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam, who all are, again, growing their economies, looking for uh, uh, suitable power sources for the, for the future. This slide and the next two are looking at uh, global power capacity in various forms. And I'm looking at it in regions and I'm focusing here on Asia uh, the first point to note, of course, is Asia's operational capacity in the power sector absolutely dwarfs the rest of the world, dwarfs Europe, dwarfs North America, and, and all other regions. It is also very heavily fossil fuel orientated. Massive amounts of coal, some oil, natural gas, then we have nuclear and hydro. And then there is certain amounts, relatively speaking, a fairly small amount of um, of solar and wind and biomass. But bear in mind, this is such a large sector that that still represents a significant amount of those, but more, uh, more are expected to be included very shortly. And, and just to put that in context, it's over about 2,700 gigawatts of capacity in that region alone. This is look, uh, same approach, but this is looking at the plants that are under construction and will go into service in due course. Uh, with power agreements already in place. You can see again, Asia dominates this 
if anything, even more. Obviously, a smaller overall level because we're talking about plants under construction. But again, a lot of coal, a lot of gas, then the, but increasing amounts of nuclear and hydro. This is the situation on plan capacity. Now, none of this is a done deal. It could well, well not proceed. But it does show, I think, very significant, the very significant change in that energy mix that's starting in the region. You're seeing much more solar showing here, for example. We're seeing much less coal, similar amount of gas at present, uh, similar amount of nuclear, but again, growing amounts of hydro and growing amounts of wind and biomass. And that's a reflection of the changes that are starting to take place across the region. I'm going to now uh, focus in on some uh, some of the countries just to give you an idea of what's happening there and what their plans are. I'm starting with the South Korea and I'll follow that with Japan, which are the OEC, major OECD countries. This slide shows that the current capacity in South Korea is 530 gigawatts. The pie chart on the right hand side shows the current energy mix. Uh, and the plans are, though, for South Korea, they will limit future nuclear options and reduce coal use. They will increase the use of gas and variable renewable energy. And they do have already some very, very heavily subsidized biomass power plants. Um, very, very heavily subsidized. Uh, and it's not clear at present whether there'll be future opportunities for more of this kind of plant. The only declared role I've seen, it's outside my remit, but I'm going to say it anyway, is the only career role I found was uh, the possible use of forestry residues to produce bioethanol within South Korea. If we move on to Japan, we get a very different picture. The, um, the picture on the right hand side shows a sketch of the country and it shows the current number of uh, co firing plants within that country. Currently, thermal fuel use is very significant, but co-firing of wood waste pellets has been extensive at various scales of operation, as indicated in that, in that picture. It's also a quirk of their accounting system that co-firing actually helps older plants meet their national efficiency targets, because when they calculate the targets, they only do it on the amount of fossil fuel that's being fed into the plant and discount the amount that's being fed in from um, biomass based or um, the zero carbon based fuels. But then you see, so there's a, there's a lot of potential already going forward or being realized on co firing in Japan. In terms of its plan through to 2030, renewable energy increases to over 50% of capacity. Coal will be cut back significantly with the older units being closed. That may have an adverse impact that some of those plants may be ones that are currently co firing. Certainly what will be a, a strong alternative to co-firing, which is seen as a medium term measure, is the introduction of hydrogen and or ammonia co-firing as another way of lowering carbon emissions. Gas use will be very limited, but nuclear use will be maintained. Uh, a few words on China. I'm sure I could talk all day on China and you don't want that. Um, one of the factors that comes into play when you look at the countries in Asia is that many of them have major agricultural economies. All the developing nations certainly have major agricultural economies. And for example, in China, where you've got a population of about 1.4 billion people, that leads to close to a billion tons worth of crop residues, such as rice stalks, rice husks, and corn stalks, as well as wood waste. Up to now, that's usually been burned in the fields, creating major pollution problems and health issues for the, for the workers. But there are options have been introduced to gain useful energy from the wastes. And one way that they found works very well is co-firing that waste in existing coal-fired power plants. You get the economy of scale from the coal units that can fully burn up those waste materials and generate useful energy through heat and steam. That said, though, the state government hasn't yet provided financial support to compensate for the low calorific value of the waste compared to the coal that you would otherwise be using. And as a result of that, the up, take up of this type of technology is very limited. In fact, it's limited to one plant at present, which I'm showing on the, on the right here. There are other possibilities. 
Uh, there's a lot of interest, has been a lot of interest in China in replacing coal power plants with close to 100% biomass fired units, big ones, big units. But that would require a major wood pellet import arrangement because they, they're, they're very interested in reforesting in China. They don't actually want to use that particularly for fuel. But it would require wood pellet import arrangements. Wood pellets are categorized as waste at, at present in China, and that doesn't meet the government's current guidelines whereby it could be used in a power plant. Uh, biomass energy CCS is an interesting option, but I think those of us who follow CCS are recognised that it's a, there's a slow deployment of this technology presently, so it's not yet a viable way forward in, in Asia. That could well change when China's current demonstration project on CCS is completed successfully, and it will be successful. Uh, and we'll, we'll so wait to see how much BEX will be taken forward into the, the energy mix. The other th Major opportunities in, in, in Asia are shown here. I just want to highlight Indonesia. That has established mandatory plans to co-fire biomass in 52 of its larger power stations. And that's part of its efforts to phase out 100% unadulterated coal power plants. And that could result in 9 million tonnes a year of coal savings. Not especially um, massive, but it's a good start. Longer term, Indonesia plans to add CCS to its coal biomass fired units. That way it can deliver negative carbon emissions. India, massive country, massive amount of agricultural wastes, rather limited program to be frank in terms of the installed capacity of biomass power in that country is, is currently four gigawatts with the expectation it will raise, rise to about 10 gigawatts by uh, end of next year. Finally, uh, Vietnam, very substantial biomass resources. A lot of studies been undertaken, but no firm plans to utilize those resources as yet. Key takeaways, uh, skip through a lot of this. There are, there are clearly opportunities for increased biomass addition in many Asian countries in the power sector. That will help to offset coal use and will achieve low over, lower overall carbon emissions. The drivers for that implementation are going to vary between developing nations and OECD countries, and that's fine. The final point I want to make, it's very important to always remember the classic energy trilemma. What you're trying to do here is balance security of supply while constraining costs and ensuring environmental uh, acceptability. Very easy to say, not quite so easy to do. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Back to you, Dina. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Very interesting presentation. Uh, the Welcome. only thing we missed was your picture, your video. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yes, good to see you. Um, so yes, uh, you mentioned those uh, different uh, drivers between OECD countries and most Asian countries. So can you just give an example? Uh, yeah. I see that that from a climate change point of view, it's very important to uh, stop using fossil fired power yeah but what's the driver for a country to do it and invest the thing is you, you take the oecd countries they are all they may not feel it but they are all relatively wealthy compared to uh, developing nations they all have infrastructure built and in being improved with modern systems going in transportation of electricity water whatever a lot of a lot of developing countries don't have that there's over a billion people that don't have access to uh, reliable power or any power in many cases in developing nations worldwide. Those countries are trying to get their economies straight and they need dispatchable power. What they're using at present is coal, which is what the OECD countries used when they were dealing this. But I think everyone appreciates that's not such a clever idea anymore. So there is there is a need to find ways to help them um, without imposing on them solutions they have to find their own way but there's there's a lot of opportunity to help them build capacity uh, in, in terms of their understanding of the energy situation but i think also you said at the start dina a lot of the plants they have at the moment are very new but they also have a lot of very old ones that can actually be should be got rid of uh, so there's, there's a lot that can be done in the near term but those older plants are going to stay it's possible that they'll be fitted with CCS in the future. That's a, that's a great hope. And uh, we just need to see that technology getting over the starting line, I think, at the moment. But then co-firing, 
Japan, uh, not, uh, use of ammonia or um, hydrogen or other ways of, of, of mitigating emissions. But the biggest way to get them down and to those coal-fired plants are such old such that they will have to be replaced is probably going to be CCS. But of course, I should stress, there is a lot of variable renewable energy going into these countries. It's just that their capacity is so large, it, it doesn't wish to hear that much. But this is, Biggest, some of the biggest markets for variable renewable energy are in, in the Asian countries. Thank okay. you, Andrew. Thank you. You're welcome. So I can I'm sorry see you didn't Jerry... have my picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. I can see that Jerry is really eager to get the panel discussion started. Um, we should still um, show the result of the first poll very briefly, um, Jerry, before we go to you. Oh, that was quite an even uh, poll. Yeah. <laughs> so we have audience on both sides, the ones saying, yes, I'm going to uh, pay a premium and others saying, well, uh, the regulators should do the job. Um, can we just quickly see the second question, please, uh, which can then be answered um, while Jerry gets uh, started with the panel discussion. So you can only choose one of these four options. What do you see as the main bottlenecks for bio-based solutions? Higher cost compared to fossil-based or limited access to sustainable biomass or technical issues or that the alternatives sound more attractive? So you can take your time in um, answering that question. I turn over to Jerry and I'm looking forward to an interesting panel presentation. Jerry, please. All right, I'm hoping that uh, Robert Boyd is still here. Uh, Robert, you, I think you addressed us over an hour ago, but hopefully you're still around. Robert, maybe he's not. Okay, well oh, then- Oh, he is, I, I can see his picture. Maybe all the panelists could um, bring in their video. That would be great. I'm, uh, I'm still here. Oh, hi, Robert. Good to see you. Hi, um, hi Jerry. Yeah, so, so as I alluded to, what we've seen is uh, this year has been very dramatic, obviously, for SAF and for aviation, where we have seen this overwhelming tipping point to the point where now the entire airline sector has committed to go net zero. Is that accurate? Yes, absolutely. And now this was many years in the making. I am curious in your view, how we got to this tipping point. And then I'm going to use that framing to kind of go to the other technologies and the other uh, sectors that we have represented here of their anticipation of how we can get to a similar tipping point around renewable chemicals, at, you know, getting the investment into um, refineries getting the uh, transition happening in Asia, et cetera. So I, I think we have time for basically that narrative. And so, uh, Robert, if you could tell us how aviation did it. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think if you joined the aviation decarbonization, well, you know, effort two years ago, you'd think this is quite easy. Everyone's on board. I think Rasmus said uh, doesn't have to do much selling these days, people want to, uh, you know, be in this movement. But really, the answer is it's, uh, and you know, many of you know this who've been involved for a decade or more. It's been a lot of hard work at absolutely every level. So from demonstrating that the problem can be solved, and this goes to technology, it also goes to understanding feedstock, um, but understanding feedstock under the right sustainability constraints. I mean, these are the easy things for people to push back on, particularly. With, for aviation to say, you know, you'll be destroying uh, rainforests or this or that. So it took a long time to have a very, very clear message of what the position of the industry is around sustainability. Now, we completely rule out anything that's not verified as sustainable. It, it's paramount. Then uh, there's a huge effort that has to take place in um, education, but particularly to um, governments and policymakers. Um, I, even three or four years ago, often, you know, in Brussels, you'd be explaining what actually is a sustainable aviation 
fuel, you know, or, or won't aircraft fall out of the sky because the fuel will freeze, you know, at below zero. Well, you know, you've got to go through that. That doesn't happen anymore. They're very, very knowledgeable, but it's um, it's been a real process. So, so to close it out, I'd say it was a decade of hard work in absolutely every facet of uh, how to demonstrate this is possible, and it got the snowball rolling, and now it is moving. It, it's actually it's almost moving so fast I can't keep track of what's going on every day. If you can keep track, you're a better man than I. I'm going to swap. To, I'm going to skip actually to Rasmus, and I'm going to say, Rasmus, one of your points that was particularly interesting was you kind of described a similar process where it seems as if, in your experience, it, just in the climate space, not talking in the biomass space, but just in the climate space, it seems that your experience has been that almost that every country, ha excuse me, every company has to do their own evaluation. Is that your experience? And is, is there a way that we could somehow streamline that and learn how to move this faster in the biospace? Yeah, so I would just nuance that a little bit. So the way that you can take that question apart is, you know, if you're a company and you've never thought about climate before, you know, where do you start? So there are plenty of industry roadmaps, for example, available. Um, and there's also, you know, even very specific roadmaps for specific countries, right? So if you're in the chemical industry in Finland, you just pick up the chemical industry decarbonization roadmap and look at what's possible. So, but that, that only gets you so far because that gives you the answer of what you need to do. And kind of let's, let's assume why has been answered already, right? But, um, but it doesn't tell you how. And I think that's where a lot of companies are, are finding the obstacle in, in, well, how do I do this in practice? So like, for example, if I'm looking at my supply chain, I'm looking at my logistics emissions, like how do I even calculate my emissions first to find out what my baseline is? Well, then you have to know that you need to go to the Global Logistics Emissions Council and pick up their framework and apply that. Once you get the insights from that, then you understand what your outbound and inbound is, and then you look at what your options are. So, so I think it's about the how, and that's a lot of hard work, to be honest, for every company to figure out, you know, what does it mean in practice for me? How will it change, you know, how my trucks load or unload at my distribution center, for example? Interesting. So Jacob, as a company that's trying to figure out the how, we have one very discreet question, which it's almost like a, a a look at the competition. So, so some people here are interested to know your views on the potential for ammonia, but you know, you're literally doing the how. So, so can you, could you give another, a little bit of color in terms of how you see Maersk dealing with the how and building off of, of what Robert said, you know, cause there's, you know, something that Robert mentioned was the international alignment and ICAO had had some very charismatic leaders there that have really driven that. What do you see as, as the, op and I know that IMO maybe just kind of kicked the can down the road, I heard somebody describe it as. A, I'm just wondering what you see as some of the stakeholders you need to get on board to get to a similar tipping point as aviation. Thank you. Um... I think we, we, we need to get the IMO on board. And uh, I don't know the details of, of those discussions, but, uh, but that's something that Maersk is trying to push uh, really hard. I know that. Uh, but, uh, but in terms of uh, how do we do this? <laughs> uh, how do we get to, to find the right fuels and how do we get started uh, decarbonizing? We, we have different pathways. Um, and uh, just to comment on ammonia, uh, which was a question, that's something that we do see as a potential, but ammonia is, quite tricky because it's a really dangerous chemical. So there are some safety issues that need to be dealt with uh, before we can start investing in ammonia and have ammonia ships. And one, one practical problem is that there, there are no ammonia uh, engines on the market now. So you cannot start buying ships uh, on ammonia. They, they, they might come three or four years from now, two or three years from now, maybe. Uh, but but, but that, that, that's a, a major challenge, of course. Uh, and I mentioned fuel cells as being a, a, a big potential for, for decarbonizing on the long run for shipping. And decarbonizing using fuel cells running on ammonia might be possible, but we're not there yet at all. So what Maersk is doing is to try to, to go into methanol because we know that it works. There are actually ships running on methanol already. 
and it can be produced from biomass. It can also be produced as an e-fuel, uh, like we have started now, uh, in one small project. I, I, I know, but uh, but we can sort of source it from different kinds of production pathways, and that that's very, really important to us. So we believe that we can produce large quantities of methanol, and we can handle it. It's a liquid. It's a, it, it has okay combustion properties. And uh, we believe it's it's a good fuel, but we need new ships for that. So we started buying into that. And at the same time, we do have 700 plus ships that need uh, oil products, like heavy fuel oil. And we also need to add some uh, green fuels to that uh, part of our company, which is the major part, of course. So, so we're looking in drop-in fuels uh, in many different ways. We, as I said in my presentation, we, we have products now based on HFO and, uh, and fame as a fuel, but we don't think we can scale that up to, to the amounts we need. So we're looking into uh, finding uh, drop-in fuels based on solid biomass, based on waste, based on maybe uh, e-fuel production pathways. And that, that will be uh, important for us in the, in the years to come. Thank did, you. Did, did Thank I you, more or less answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Thank you. No, I mean, I'm trying to, to, to loop everybody in, and but I, I'd like to turn to Alessandro. <clears throat> Alessandro, you, you made a very uh, clear case for the need for investment in the fossil fuel sector. Uh, I know that recently the leader of OPEC was pointing to a, a much larger number that in order to maintain energy security, that additional investment is needed in the fossil fuel sector. Um, clearly, there's a lot of people that don't want to give any money to the fossil fuel sector. How do you think that, um, do you think that there is a way for your members and for your association to help communicate the, um, to help de-risk the use of biomass and can that enable some of your investment? You're muted. Jared. Let me unmute, uh, yes. So uh, thank you, Gerard. That's it's a very good question. And uh, it goes with the, the with the transition of an industry, of a system, uh, of, a, of a way we approach uh, energy for transport. Um, it is complex. There is a lot of uh, uh, prejudice about what uh, what can be done. And I'm, I regret to say that also in the uh, political debate, uh, quite often decisions are taken uh, without uh, um, scientific basis about, based on what is more popular or, or on ideological premises. This is not going to, to bring us to the solution. So you mentioned correctly investments, uh, quoting what I said, that, that, that's the key. So we need to have uh, manufacturing facilities making fuels out of uh, biogenic or recycled CO2. So what uh, is going to be burned uh, in vehicles, in ships, in aviation should not add anything to the, to the CO2 in the atmosphere. This is the, the key point. Uh, today in Europe, I'm talking about Europe, but I think it can be expanded to, to the globe. We do not have enough uh, capacity to build this, uh, to, to produce these fuels because there are not uh, investments enough. They are growing and there is a push to, to grow them, but this is not uh, enough yet. We really need to, as the term uh, is used, uh, unlock the, the capability to, to invest. And then we, we turn to the policymakers and this is the, the job of my association uh, and telling them, uh, look, our investors, our industries, our, uh, um, our companies need, uh, first of all, a, a stable regulatory framework. We have had the back experience, uh, many of us uh, in, the, in the biofuels area, especially with uh, regulation that changed significantly and uh, investments that could not maintain what they were, uh, that they were selected for because of uh, legislation, the perspective changes. This should not happen. We should have a stable regulatory framework. We should have a stable uh, um, delta value between uh, the low carbon fuels and the fossil fuels. That's the basis for investment, for the return on investment. Uh, and this has to be reliable for investors. Otherwise they will not invest simply because it's, it's too risky because they cannot see a return on investment. So again, uh, the delta value comes from the regulation. At the same time, and this is also an important point, uh, is to keep uh, the, um, 
the industry during the change is particularly vulnerable, competitive. So don't uh, give up on the competitiveness of the, on the industry. This is a, an issue that it is central for us uh, in Europe. Uh, we talk, for example, of the energy that um, um, the ETS. Uh, so, uh, in, in the ATS, uh, there is a, a big issue of uh, uh, the um, uh, carbon leakage. How do you protect the industries from carbon leakage? So, you know, there are free certificates for, uh, for industries, part of the certificates that we need to buy are for free, and this is to, to make a level playing field. Now, we say that the transition is happening, it requires a lot of resources, and we are vulnerable don't reduce the uh, protection from carbon leakage, so against carbon leakage, uh, and keep the competitiveness of the industry, because only in this way we can put the resources uh, to transform. And this is in the interest, uh, not just of, of our industry, it is in the interest of the economy, other sectors. Let me mention the agricultural sectors. How many jobs can be created by this uh, bio, bio energy value chain? Uh, how can we develop rural, rural areas? Can you imagine what the potential is there? So this is really a, a bet we need to win together. Uh, Andrew, I, I think that much of what Alessandro says kind of sets you up, but the question that came to my mind as you were speaking was, do you anticipate the potential for a kind of a leapfrog and in particular, I think something that was mentioned by all the speakers is the potential whereby biomass is not the solution, but biomass provides carbon and hydrogen that feeds into a more general carbon hydrogen economy, right? So you'll have green hydrogen, you'll have um, carbon capture and use, you'll have biomass providing um, not just an opportunity for combustion, but then also an opportunity for um, to provide carbon into products and fuels, et cetera. Do you see uh, stirrings along those lines? I know that your focus is, is, is swapping out on the combustion side, but looking ahead, do you see this these synergies between carbon capture and use, green hydrogen and, and, and biomass working together? Yes, this is a short answer to that. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Well, then I'll next. A bit more, if I may. Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. I mean, we're, we're already seeing some of that. Um, uh, one thing I'll just pick up, which hasn't really been discussed from a coal or a carbon source, creating non energy products from coal. You can turn coal, hard coal, not lignite, you can turn hard coal through various existing processes or processes under development. You can get, you can make graphene. graphene graphite, all sorts of end products from that, which you can get from coal. From the ashes of the coal, you can actually extract critical minerals, minerals that you need to actually include in your, in the, in your wind turbines and, and so on and so forth. And they're Hopefully very- there's some cobalt it's, in there. I'm sorry? It would be good if there was cobalt in your coal. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. These, 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 very mineral, these minerals are critical because there's not much of them. And to be blunt, China's actually secured a lot of them through its Belt, belt and Road Initiative. You know, it sort of, it offers, um, it offers uh, power plants to developing countries and, and gets paid in the rights, the mineral rights to these um, uh, critical minerals. So you, coal has, has a, I think, a potentially important strategic value in the future, getting at these critical minerals. The other points you made are absolutely right. And we're already starting to see a lot of that starting to happen here. again. I mean, China gets a bad press, but there's actually a lot of stuff happening out there that doesn't perhaps get publicized. Well, I, well, so yeah, I mean, I know that biomass has a heavy lift, but yeah, the idea of using coal as a um, materials feedstock. Yeah. Uh, you know, we no, need to see the LCA, destroyed. we need to see the analysis, but that, that's going to be politically a very heavy lift. So absolutely, uh, that's really an interesting idea. So let's let's bring it around to the sort of the underlying issue, which is which I I kind of dealt with awkwardly because I was asleep. This idea of competing uses, and so switching back to Rasmus, 
you know, we both show different uh, graphs from the excellent Energy Transition Commission report. I emphasize that, and, and the, the, the ETC did a nice job actually of highlighting this massive diversity in estimates of availability. And even in their own estimates, the ETC's own estimates, as you pointed out, there's the sort of the likely or the conservative estimate, and then there's, you double that and you get to their optimistic estimate, right? So um, my question to you is, given the conventional wisdom, um, do you think that the conventional wisdom that we need to be, how do you see the conventional wisdom? Is this like just an evolution of the, real unease with biomass? Or do you see this current conventional wisdom as a stepping stone to a broader acceptance of bio and waste-based fuels, chemicals, and materials? Um, I see it as a stepping stone. And the reason I see it as a stepping stone is that I think it's been happening for a little while, um, but very much in specialized circles originally. And now it's becoming much more broadly accepted that it's actually damn hard to decarbonize the economy, right? <laughs> I mean, it sounds so obvious to say that, but it just hasn't, the, as, as the Brits would say, the penny hasn't dropped for a lot of people yet. And, and I think through that recognition, how difficult it actually is in practice, um, particularly for some of the hard to abate sectors, um, there is a growing recognition that, yes, you know, we need to look beyond the simple solutions which have very simple or easier public acceptance, you know, voter acceptance. Um, so, for example, you know, build out of, of, of solar and wind uh, um, as, as two examples. And then I would just say also that, um, you know, maybe rounding it back to one of the questions which was in the Q&A um, around, um, you know, green hydrogen. Uh, essentially from, from renewables. So, you know, when we've now become more sophisticated in our understanding of what the needs of the different sectors are in terms of electrification, um, we also understand that there's a huge constraint as well in terms of our build-out capacity for renewables to service all the end uses for electrification, of which, you know, a huge new chunk essentially is the green hydrogen piece, um, which has received a lot of, of, uh, of airtime recently. So, so if you think in terms of, you know, how is this system going to be set up? Um, we need an incredible amount of renewables to be built out um, for electrification and for green hydrogen. And that also means that particularly for bioenergy, um, in the near term, we certainly need bioenergy. Now, the question of where bioenergy goes in the long term, once we've got more time to build out some of the electrification, let's say, system level infrastructure as well, then it's a different question. Um, but so, so the theme really here is, is two things. One is it's incredibly hard to decarbonize and the things that we thought were simple. It's still a huge task. Right. And, and I appreciate that. And, and, and something that is interesting that I think was a new idea uh, a year ago is this idea that the use of biomass will transition over time. And now it was in all of your presentations, presentations that we're understanding that with electrification and, and Alessandro's point about demand from transport coming down to meet the available biomass, I think was well made. Um, like, so, 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 getting to, so, so, so getting to catalyzing uptake, a lot of it is on the demand side, right? And so, so Jakob is obviously representing, well, and he's sort of an intermediary, but I wanna to skip to Robert again. I wanna ask Robert, you know, we've seen a lot of work around creating these buyers alliances within SAP. Can you, um, can you talk about them as a vehicle for communicating the nuances of biomass? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. There are a number of these, um, we call them alliances, that are formed. They're demand signals. They're bringing in other stakeholders outside of perhaps the direct aviation operator. So, for instance, the corporate sector is very active now in um, almost in procurement of sustainable aviation fuel, which wasn't the case even 12 months ago or, or, or 18 months ago. And that's been, that's been a very positive um, outcome of some of these 
international efforts. I know even some that you've been talking about for years, uh, Jerry, they're coming, um, they're materializing here. I don't, in terms of direct impact on biomass, I'm not sure that they are specifically addressing one particular biomass option. It's more, perhaps more of an agnostic approach as long as there's a demonstration for it to be sustainable. You know, I think in aviation, we stand behind the verification schemes that really are the experts in determining um, sustain, sustainability. But, the, but in terms of a general sense, there's no doubt that these alliances are adding very, very strong demand signals. Um, do you feel that when, do you feel that when, uh, when companies come forward and say that they're, they're going to buy this, do you feel that that really impacts uh, reputation and, and perception of risk amongst other companies that might be on the fence or not even aware of this? Yes, it, it is. Um, it, it is doing that. It is changing. It's broadening the understanding across all the entire corporate sector. I think we're in a little bit of a honeymoon period, if I'm honest, right now, where there's a lot of announcements and really positive um, things that have been said. Uh, it needs to translate into real action, and I think, and that includes the industry commitment and everything. You know, um, this has to be demonstrated now and almost. I think, I think it'll be tracked almost yearly as to what's the progress, uh, and it should be, you know, you can't just have these great announcements and not be accountable. I, I, I am going to bring it around one more time to everybody, but, but Robert, I, that connects you back to the, the things like the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Is there a connection? And, and I think this should be the question that we should focus on. Like, you're talking about reporting and like building confidence in SAF. Is there a direct link to SB, like the SB, the science-based targets? Is there a direct link to some of the efforts coming from Wean Bean Business? How is that working? And what could we learn for, say, road transport, uh, maritime, and or uh, biomass for power from that? And that that'll be the question that I'll ask the rest of you. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky. This is a tricky question. It's a good one. Um, the I mean, I can speak on behalf of the industry here and putting it very plainly, I completely acknowledge that the trajectory I showed in my slides does not perfectly align with the science-based target um, initiative. That said, there are some airlines that have made commitments uh, to, to be on that pathway. I mean, we are looking in, in our decarbonisation as an industry, we are still taking on board out of sector uh, reductions. So by 2035, it's fair to say we're not uh, in perfect alignment. By 2050, yes. But I acknowledge that that's, I, I think that's just a challenge that, you know, we've made a lot of progress to date. I'm not going to oversell it that we're ahead of the science-based target. We aren't. Um, we can continue to, to push our industry more and get more airlines onto that trajectory, but that's the state of play. Okay, we'll go to Rasmus and then uh, Jakob, Alessandro and Andrew. Uh, the, the last question is, the role of metrics and reporting in building confidence at Rasmus, please. Yeah, so just to pick up on, on previously, so the way the science-based targets initiative works is that um, the methodologies follow the science, right? And so you need researchers, you need um, uh, companies with expertise, you need different groupings to contribute to the science so that the methodologies can be set, right? And so the science-based targets initiative has for different sectors methodologies, and these will also evolve over time, right? Um, we just saw, um, you know, the 1.5 degree, you know, um, guidance come out, for example, and, and 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 we're expecting more guidance on scope three emissions, for example, coming up next year, also around neutralization and compensation. These concepts. so so it's evolving. And uh, the good thing, though, is that the, the SBTI um, is is working together with organizations like the ETC um, to inform, you know, how that methodology improves over time. Uh, but also, we're connected into the uh, Mission Possible partnership, where we have, you know, aviation, shipping, trucking that you just mentioned, but also industries like chemicals, steel, aluminium, cement, um, who again those supply side companies who form the core of, of NPP are developing roadmaps um, and, and those will then inform again SBTI. So I think it's great that we're seeing this concentration of uh, agreements of a, a standard, a definition in SBTI, 
but it's also okay that it's not the only one, right? Uh, let's be clear about that. That's that's it's something that that will evolve over time. But the the key role in these kinds of standards is, and this goes for the demand side campaigns that you mentioned as well, Jerry, is it simplifies the decisions for companies, right? When there's a group of companies and organizations, NGOs who have already worked on what does it mean to have the right ambition, take the right action, and how do I prove that? And and you can you can trust that that has been de-risked in some ways, right? And um, and I'm and I'm I'm very hopeful actually uh, seeing a lot of good good action um, on, on that side as well. Well, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for everybody else, we're, I think we're out of time. And so I guess I'll hand off to Dina because it is uh, the end of the two hours. And so you've been very generous. Uh, thank you all for your contributions. Thank you all for sticking with us. And uh, Dina, I'll let you wrap it up. Thank you very much, Jerry. So that was so interesting. I, I would have I would not have uh, had a problem if you say you're gonna discuss for another half an hour, but we might have the, the option to go on discussing at least with some of you because we have that WonderMe application and it's posted in the chat how to get there. Uh, it would be really great to see uh, some of the speakers there as well. And um, of course, everyone from the audience who is still interested in taking that discussions further. Um, to wrap up, um, I think it would be great to see the results of the second poll. So what well, do they we were think? up? They can we have them once again? I missed that probably. <laughs> click on poll button. Um, click on poll button. Can't see it now. Polls and quizzes. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So it's the higher cost that identified with a slight preference. Um, as, as the hardest bottleneck, uh, but also the access to sustainable biomass. And that's also an issue that has come up in many questions here. So we recognize that it is a limited source. Uh, how can we make the best of it and make sure that the sectors get what they need? So um, I think that's it for this session today. Um, in case you don't have time to go to the WonderMe, there is also a question box on the website uh, where you could pose a session specific questions and those will be forwarded to the speakers afterwards. So you can still get your answers um, on that way. And uh, I'd like to mention that the bioenergy conference will continue next week. So the next sessions will take place on Monday uh, one on waste and residue valorization in a circular economy, and another one on industrial symbiosis and biorefineries in a circular economy. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, especially thank the speakers for sharing their views, and thanks for, to the audience. And uh, Jerry, if you have any last words, please go ahead. <laughs> Nothing anymore. So then thanks for very uh, interesting I, I, I will discussion. actually go to the wonder me. I will do so as well. So hope All to right. meet very many good. of you there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.